Welcome to Raider Cop Podcast. I'm your host, Al Martinez, also known as Alpha Mike. And we are discussing today episode 309, Empty Pockets. What we're going to be talking about, well, it's a little complicated. It deals with our wellness program, specifically, and in healthcare and hospitals. How it's becoming more and more difficult to deal with hospitals and specific things that they have that the government has built into their business plan and you can't do anything about it. But we have that and a lot more we are going to cover. Let's start off with our intro. And as you know, in our intro, we always cover some type of news or something that's happening in Joe Biden's America. Today is no different. We introduced the United States uh, Surgeon General, which declares gun violence a public health crisis. Dr. Vivek Murthy calls on the U.S. to ban ARs, universal background checks. You know that nonsense with universal background checks, which they do, by the way. It's the ATF's form. When you go buy a gun, you got to fill it out. And since Bill Clinton was president, they've been bullshitting around with the issue of universal background checks. It's a coded system. It basically means what they really want is to have a registry system of who is buying what gun and they can put it in a data bank. That's what they want for quick and fast access. So the BS with the universal background checks, which we do, we've been doing, will always pop up. You always hear the good demis and lefties tell us that that's what they want, even though it exists. But the U.S. Surgeon General here declaring a public health crisis, well, you see, the real crisis is the ATF, which is masquerading like a law enforcement agency. Let's look at those three alphabetic letters, agency, A as in alcohol, the prohibition, that's long gone, we don't do that anymore. And then there's alcohol, tobacco stands for the T. Well, today everybody and their mother is smoking a joint for, of course, health reasons. And then we have F as the grade that Joe Biden should be receiving for his administration, an F. And that stands for firearms. And the only thing the ATF has ever done is make sure that we, our rights, are more and more violated. It's been so bad for the Biden administration's ATF that they have lost a lot of lawsuits one after another. Why? Because their insatiable appetite to control Americans and to has unjust rules is just far-fetched and too ridiculous. As a result, they've been losing. Well, don't you worry about that anymore. We'll just push the ATF over to the side. And we're going to concentrate now on the U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy. I don't know who he is either. 
But I do know that the U.S. Surgeon General likes to wear a funny little uniform and make them look very militaristic. I bet you any amount of money. I'm going to look it up too. That Vivek here, Dr. Vivek, probably never served in the military. Anyway, back to the original subject, and that is that he has declared a health crisis public health crisis, gun violence. And what the hell that's supposed to mean? I don't know. I suppose you could also declare traffic accidents, cars, public health, emergency as well. Boy, you can't make up this type of stupid, but they're doing it. This specific issue that I'm talking about is reached the level of importance for us to do a podcast episode all by itself in honor of Dr. Vivek. And we will, but we just wanted to bring it up in the intro. You'll hear this information I just told you and some other things to highlight it. And our second bit of news is the debate is vastly approaching. Less than 48 hours, we will see CNN and the silence button being pressed to tell 45, stop, you can't talk no more. We don't know what the outcome is going to be, but I'm really not too concerned about 46 because you see, folks, he has to stand or sit for an hour and he has to say several sentences off script and on point. You know that the President of the United States, 46 Joe Biden, better known as Crooked Joe, has been practicing for over five days locked up practicing for this debate. Nobody's seen, seen head or hair of them. Imagine that. Remember the, uh, the TV show you used to say, imagine if you will. Imagine if you will that the President of the United States has to take five days locked up somewhere to practice on his debate. And he can't do anything else. Chew gum, talk, debate, run the country. Can't do it. One at a time. And nobody sees a problem with it. Yeah, it's good. They got the, uh, what do you call it? The clown that does the, um, the speaking for him. She's going around the country explaining what he's, he's about to say. He hasn't said it yet, but they're going to tell you what he's about to say. So that covers that. It's disgusting in itself. But remember, this episode, episode 309, is called Empty Pockets. And it's something that's going to disgust you as well. We're going to dive into it soon enough. Now, if you're looking for gun training, good, affordable gun training in the Tampa Bay area, Raider Cop TAC, Raider Cop TAC, T-A-C dot com. That's who we are. We can train you in revolver, pistol, shotgun, the amount of time you want, one-on-one, -on -one. whatever deficiency you might have. You might be a new shooter. We can go through there. You might be an intermediate shooter. We can teach you some pretty good stuff. RaiderCopTacTAC.com is a list of our training programs, and you can give us a call. Our number is 813-942-7400. That's 813-942-7400. And we also have RaiderCop.com. That's RaiderCop.com. 
You can contact us there for the podcast at RadarCopPodcast dot Proton Me P R O T O N dot Me M E. And if you go to RadarCop dot com, you can hear all our shows from number one to number three o nine, which is this one. That's a lot of listening, so we encourage you to do so. So don't forget, folks, RadarCop dot com. And RaiderCopTac, T-A-C dot com. Now it's time to turn to our Bibles, and we are going to look at uh, episode, no, not an episode, it's a chapter. You're going to have to give me a minute as I try to look it up here. So we're going to go to Bibles in Galatians. I'm punching that in as I speak to you. And we are going to flip to chapter 3. And starting at verse 10. And we're going to see what we can find here. Give me a minute. Because it is now giving me... I should have been... Better prepared, they said, which is true. The reason I'm not is because I decided before I started this podcast that I would record myself. And guess what? It's recording on my phone. And then on my phone is my Bible. So I had to go to the computer and do it. And uh, learning curve, learning curve. So Galatians 3.10 and let's go to, I usually use the New King James Version. And we will start, read the full chapter, and we will push this forward so I can actually read it. And it says, You foolish Galatians who have bewitched you before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly Portrait portrayed and crucified. Would you would you like to learn just one thing from you? Did you receive the Spirit? Stop. So I am not. You are listening to episode three hundred nine, Empty Pockets. I'm your host, Al Martinez on Rare to Call Podcast, and we are talking about a very serious issue dealing with hospitals, and specifically hospitals in Florida, but it is rampant and getting worse around the country. Now, as many of you know, in other podcasts, I've talked about a sibling of mine that is still in the hospital. We're probably going on day 68. It's a long time to be in a hospital. The life-threatening aspect of that stay is over. They're not in life-threatening uh, situations. But the hospital has made a lot of gray ever errors, producing bladder infections and other infections that uh, my sibling didn't have. They gave it to him. Mercer was also given to him at the hospital, as well as a broken finger. That's right. Didn't have one when he walked in, but he has one now. And we could be here a long time about malpractice. Now, the purpose of a malpractice lawsuit is not necessarily just making money. It is a form of negotiating better treatment for a specific individual, a patient. And of course, the penalties that come with it, the pain and suffering, is for it not to happen again. But governments have created a little special technique that hospitals are not going to be able to get sued and 
to me, it's disturbing when I learned this. Not that we had considered a sue for money. You see, when the, my sibling was on a ventilator for 18 days with sedation medication, which is very bad for that length of time, that the medical journals themselves say that that sedation medication shouldn't be given more than 48 hours. My sibling received it for 18 days, heavily sedated, and they wouldn't take him out of that state. It was life-threatening. But through perseverance, God's help, we got through. Eminem was there helping us every step of the way. And we got them, we got the medical staff to take them off that sedation medication and wake them up and take them off the ventilator. And that was the beginning of this journey. Today, I think it's day 68, maybe 67, give or take. A lot of other things have happened to him, but the life-threatening issue is over. What was concerning is when he was on the ventilator, they wanted to give a morphine drip, basically, and I said that in the other episodes. Uh, if he doesn't make it, it's a humane way of letting the individual go with a morphine drip. I said, no, no morphine drip. Well, do you want CPR to be done? Yeah, I'm sure do. They didn't like those answers, but those are the ones they received. We were fortunate enough to get them off sedation medication and get them up, but we're going to discover a whole mess of issues. During those 18 days on sedation, I, on his behalf, I went out and contacted various law firms, four to be exact. All of them said, you got a case. But they would tell me something that would blow my mind and disgust me beyond repair. We continue to navigate in his situation to get him off sedation, and we were successful, like I said. And we're still going through this system, but let's take a deep dive in what we're talking about. Here's a couple of terms that are important. Remember, this is an education type of episode podcast, in case you ever have a loved one in a hospital, how to navigate through that. That's why we're doing these wellness episodes. So, certificate of need. A certificate of need in the state of Florida was created if a community wanted to have a hospital in their community. It was something that the bureaucrats and government wanted to make sure that you should have a hospital because you met certain criteria. Now, I don't really know what that criteria was because in 2019, the legislation removed that certificate of need, what it was called. In 2019, they dropped it. 2020, even during the COVID era, since 2020 to 2022, Florida would see 65 new hospitals being built or have already been built because the certificate of need was thrown out. Now these hospitals can just set up shop wherever they want. 
It's an important term. Now, some people want that certificate of need to come back. And some people say, what's the point of bringing it back? I'm not going to talk on that subject. That's a political one. I think any community that wants a hospital should meet certain criteria, right? You can't have a community of 15 people and they want a 300-bed hospital serving them. So there has to be some type of criteria and standard. So we're not going to talk about that because that's a legislative procedure. The government of Florida decided to take that certificate of need away. Let's move on. Safety net system is uh, a law that was created in Florida to treat and stabilize all patients who come from an ER. So if you come into the hospital, you're in the emergency room, that facility must treat and stabilize all patients, okay, before they go anywhere. So the issue is the defining of stabilized. In my current situation of my sibling, there are some issues with him that we as a family don't think he's ready to be discharged. But now the government, through Medicaid, is very upset because he's been there 67, 68 days. They want him discharged, sent somewhere else, rehabilitation center, whatever that looks like, wherever that is, we don't know. But there's a lot of deep medical issues that are still pending and concerning. So a safety net system is a law which must treat all peoples and stabilize all patients who come from an emergency room into a hospital, okay? And then the reason we're here, number three, the most important one of them all, the mag daddy of stupidity, sovereign immunity. And for me to tell you what sovereign immunity is, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a lawyer, I don't play a lawyer on TV either, but we'll take the opportunity and read to you a great article from seniorjustice.com, seniorjustice.com, and it says the following. Let me get a little closer here so the eyeballs can actually see it. Florida has a Florida has strict sovereign immunity laws that protect certain hospitals from negligence and malpractice lawsuits. Sovereign immunity means the government owns or operates the hospital, so it is immune from a civil lawsuit. However, Litigants in Florida are not completely barred from suing sovereign immune hospitals. Instead, Section 13 of Article 10 of Florida's Constitution permits claims of lawsuits to be brought against state-run hospitals. Just because the Constitution allows Flor Floridians to sue government hospitals, this doesn't mean it's easy to do. So it goes on. Florida law on suing hospitals that have sovereign immunity. Florida law limits the damages one can obtain from sovereign immunity. Medical malpractice lawsuits. Further, the law cap caps the attorney fees at 25%. Now, you know, the lawyers, the lawyers are like 33 and a third and, and higher. You know, they, God forbid they gotta make copies but because this special statute here, sovereign immunity, 
20, it's capped at 25%. So that doesn't, there are a lot of lawyers, a lot of lawyers don't, they don't like this. They, they don't like it, so they won't take the case. For both of these reasons, it is challenging to find a Florida lawyer to take a case uh, versus a uh, sovereign immunity hospital. The relevant statute states as follows, neither the state nor its agencies or subdivisions shall be liable to pay a claim or judgment by any one person which exceeds the sum of 200,000 or any claim or judgment or portion thereof, which when totaled with all the claims and judgments paid by the state or its agencies or subdivisions arise out of the same incident or occurrence exceeds the sum of 300,000. The Florida Statute 768.28 Sovereign Immunity Hospitals of Florida. It gives a whole list of them. I'm not going to bore you with the list, but it's telling. It is very telling. Run by governments, or operated by governments, somehow, you can't sue. I mean, you could but you're only gonna get a little bit of money. You're not gonna get a lot of money. But the government pays them through Medicaid. I'm confused. I'm confused. So we, we go on. Available damages to a litigant suing a Florida hospital that has sovereign immunity. Currently, Florida has capped a plaintiff's ability to recover against sovereign entities. The amount of damages that can be recovered in, the, in a case against a state-run hospital is limited to 200000 as we said before. A claims bill can be filled to seek compensation beyond the sovereign immunity limit. However, it's an important word, these are really successful. The lawyers, they don't want the case. The lawyers, they don't want it. Recognizing the inherent unfairness in the Florida sovereign immunity law, our legislation has recently considered amending the law and allowing sovereign Florida hospitals to be held accountable for more, for more damages. Some legislators support increasing the cap to 300000 That's how generous they are while others have proposed amending the law to allow plaintiffs to recover $1 million from the government-run hospitals. However, as of this post or this podcast, the law remains unchanged and an injured or wrongful killing killed hospital patient can only recover 200000 from a servant Florida hospital. But remember, the lawyers, they don't want it. You can't get water from an empty well. Got it? And they got to make money, too. You know, these poor bastards got to send their kids to college. So here's a list of most lawsuits that happen in hospitals. Patient falls. Surgical errors, ah, oh, shit, the sponge. Wrongful early discharge. Failing to diagnose a stroke. I don't know why he's all bent up. Nursing errors. And bed sores or uh, pressure ulcers. So these are the most common lawsuits. but they got sovereign immunity. Can you imagine you're listening to me today, or watching me on, on video, that you had sovereign immunity? You wouldn't even need insurance. What the hell do you need insurance for? You just drive around, do what the hell I want, but you can't sue me. 
And then I come up with some crazy idea like, um, all right, okay, well, you do have the right to sue, but you're only allowed to get 30, 30 or 40 dollars from me if you win. You know, you gotta win. And I'm, I'm capping it at 30 or 40 dollars. This is the crap we're doing here. Now, for those that are saying, well, I think he's trying to get money. No, I'm not trying to get money. Do you know how much money you need to take care of somebody that got off a ventilator, they were on a ventilator for 18 days? My sibling currently has listed on their app 14 ailments. Of course, some are more severe than others. So medical care in general is very expensive. And he's got an insurance that can only pay so much with deductibles. And Medicaid picks up the rest because he's up there in age, right? But they don't pay everything. That 20% is still out there for the patient. And a lot of those 20% bills go unpaid because they can't pay it. They don't have the means to pay it. So giving the special status takes away a lot of these patients' ability to work out a negotiating settlement with a hospital that has committed errors, in some points grave errors. You know, yeah, they broke his finger. You ask him what happened. You know what it? Well, we don't know. I don't know what happened to him. But the finger's broken. The finger wasn't broken when he came in. So that's just one of them. And, and Mercer and other infections that he's received because of whatever title you want to give it, negligence or goofiness, but he has them. And there's not a lawyer on the planet, a lawyer on the pl planet that will take the case because it's a sovereign immune hospital and the amount of money, if anything, is very limited. And the attorneys need tremendous resources to sue. They need their own medical professionals to tell them if they have a case or not. They have to translate medical language, the charts, their files, their condition when they came in and see if there's liability. So they need a lot of, a lot of money, but there's a cap. The cap is absurd in today's legal dollars. So the patient that doesn't have two nickels rubbed together also loses the ability to negotiate their medical attention. They're thrown and discharged way beyond what they should be. It should be there a lot longer. The hospitals claim, well, this deadbeat laying on a bed is taking the right away from a new patient entering. And sometimes that isn't the case because their occupancy levels are not 100%. So here you have the hospital business and the hotel business Government is protecting them and getting a piece of the action. And the little guy, the stinkies, always get the short end of the stick. It's sad, 
but it's real.